Y'all get ready. Yes, you get ready. You want the latest news in the streets? Join us and tune in for the tea. Breaking news with integrity. So sell your friends and your family. It's the lovely TV show. Bringing you good tea and good vibes. It's the lovely TV show. Be sure to share, like, and subscribe. Hey, tea sippers. I hope you guys are doing good. I am still under the weather. Like, ugh, I feel horrible. Um, I think I just have a cold, so I just literally, I was going to finish the day, I think I'm on day three of my Puerto Rico trip, but I just ended up laying down yesterday after I uploaded the last video, so I've just really been in bed for the most part, um, but today's a bright sunny day, so I'm like, let me just get up, I gotta keep, you know what I'm saying, putting up the content, because it's just, every day there's news, every day there's news, so... And I know I took a whole week off, you know, last week, so I'm trying to make up for lost time. So I think everybody they baba been asking me about Vice President Kamala Harris's choice, which is Tim Waltz, and he is the governor of Minnesota. And guess what? Your girl, lovely T. I live here in Minnesota, I'm from Minnesota, St. Paul, you know what I'm saying? Shout out to all my uh, uh, St. Paul, Minneapolis people. So I was shocked this morning when I seen it. If you guys don't know, the ad is not running where Kamala is giving, you know, Tim Waltz a call just like she did. You know, we did it, Joe. Y'all go ahead and check out their latest ad right here. Hi, this is Tim. It's Kamala Harris. Good morning, Governor. Good morning, Madam Vice President. Listen. I want you to do this with me. Let's let's do this together. Would you be my running mate and let's get this thing on the road? I would be honored, Madam Vice President. Uh, the joy that you're bringing back to the country, the enthusiasm that's out there, uh, it would be a privilege to take this with you across the country. Well, let me tell you, I have just the utmost respect for you. I have really enjoyed our work together. You understand our country. You have dedicated yourself to our country in, in so many different and beautiful ways. And we're gonna do this, we're gonna win, and we're gonna unify our country and remind everyone that we are fighting for the future for everyone. So let's get out there and get this done, okay? Let's do it, do the work in front of us, let's win this thing. That's right, all right buddy, I'll see you soon, take care. All right, so y'all just saw the ad, so obviously, you know, our vice president is very, very excited, but Emotions are very mixed on social media. You have some people who are definitely for Tim Waltz. Other people are calling him Tampon Tim. Um, it's a lot of shit trending right now on uh, Twitter. It is insane, the trending topics. But yeah, Tampon Tim, he's a weirdo. Um, let's see, what else is trending here? Kamala and Tim. So people have varying opinions of um, Tim Waltz. And being that he's my governor here... I don't feel one way or another about Tim. I think he's a decent governor for the most part. Um, you know, he's legalized a lot of policies that people here are now enjoying. As you guys know, one of my really good friends owns his own marijuana shop. And, you know, uh, Tim approved marijuana here in Minnesota. So, yeah, go Tim. <laughs> but there are other things that he's kind of approved that's made me side-eye him. And the whole, you know, a lot of people were not really feeling him wanting there to be pads and tampons in the boys' bathroom. Um, you know, the whole transgender issue, we're not gonna get into that here. But a lot of people are not feeling that. Um, it was almost like he was being too liberal for a lot of folks. But for the most part, he is a very down-to-earth governor. Like, you can literally see him at the state fair. Um, you know, he's he's around. He's out and about. He's not, like, hard to find um, when it comes to things. He has a really good background. He's from Nebraska, a really rural town. And he was voted he was voted our 31st governor in 2018, and he also won a re-election. <laughs> Election night 2022, Governor Tim Walz could not contain his exuberance over winning a second term, moving past turbulent times of a global pandemic and civil unrest. Democracy is live and well in this state. Well done. 
Walls grew up in a small town in northern Nebraska, where at the age of 17, he joined the Army National Guard. He served in the Guard 24 years, all while embarking on a teaching career that in 1996 brought him to Minnesota, where he met his future wife and fellow teacher Gwen. He was still teaching geography and coaching football at Mankato West in 2006 when he ran for Congress in southern Minnesota's Republican-leaning 1st District. Once in a generation, we have the ability to do something about it. He unseated longtime incumbent Gil Goodneck and went on to spend 12 years in Congress. Oh, good to see you. <laughs> in 2018, Walls launched his bid for governor on the theme of One Minnesota and made history by picking state rep Peggy Flanagan, a member of the White Earth Ojibwe Nation, as his running mate. The governor-elect Tim Walls. He defeated Hennepin County Commissioner Jeff Johnson that November. We are One Minnesota better together. The governor, First Lady Gwen Walls, and their children, Gus and Hope, moved to St. Paul, where Walls set about leading the charge for historic spending increases on schools, child care, and housing. I'm going to extend today the stay-at-home order until May 4th. During the COVID pandemic, he aggressively pursued testing and vaccines, but took heat from Republicans for his stay-at-home orders and closing schools and businesses. That's a greater risk. And in the unrest after George Floyd's murder, Walls drew criticism for delays activating the National Guard. This force going in there escalated. He won re-election in 2022, defeating Dr. Scott Jensen, and worked with the DFL-controlled legislature to sign a host of bills, strengthening abortion rights, tightening gun control, banning conversion therapy, restoring voting rights to felons, legalizing cannabis, and providing universal free school meals. Thank you, guys. So I see a lot of people going off and saying, you know, because of the George Floyd issue, he allowed Minnesota to burn down. But if he was that bad, why was he reelected? Like, let's keep that real. And I was here for George Floyd. <clears throat> I, like many people in Minnesota, still suffer from PTSD. That was a horrible time. But let's stop acting like Minnesota was the only town that burned. OK, it started in the Twin Cities and then that powder keg spread everywhere. So if we're going to blame Tim Waltz for so-called allowing Minnesota to burn, should we also blame the governor of, of Pennsylvania because his city was burning? Philly was on fire. Well, Brian, we all remember seeing these images in both May and June of 2020. Now the city has agreed to pay a record $9.25 million to more than 300 protesters who were injured by Philadelphia police during demonstrations following the murder of George Floyd. The absurdity of being the subject of police brutality during a protest against police brutality was not lost on us. Ed Parker was one of 347 plaintiffs in four separate lawsuits filed against the city after these graphic events played out on both I-676 and West Philadelphia's 52nd Street corridor. On the highway, multiple people were tear gassed and at one point three demonstrators were sprayed at very close range in their faces by former police officer Richard Nicoletti. Should we also blame the governor of New York? New York was on fire. L.A. was a hot mess, honey. Should we also blame Gruesome Newsome? No. So I think... You know, I think he could have moved quicker as far as like apprehending people. I think they should have bought in the National Guard and stuff like that a lot quicker. But this was unprecedented times. We were dealing with COVID. Um, then the George Floyd situation happened. And it was literally like a powder keg that just exploded all over the country. Hell, even globally. So I can't blame one man for that. Because if that's the case, then should people just also blame Donald Trump? Because he was the president at that time. And when you're the president of the quote-unquote free world, which is America, he would have more blame in this situation than even Tim Waltz. So... I just think it's just one of those situations where what was meant to happen was going to happen. I'm not going to blame him for like the response per se. Um, and really, it could have been a lot worse in the Twin Cities. I think really only like one or two people died. It wasn't like a mass casualty outside of the George Floyd situation. Those riots, literally one person was shot trying to rob um, the pawn shop over south. It could have been a lot worse. So let's keep that real. So I don't know. I think I'm excited for this. It's kind of exciting me as a Minnesotan to see Tim Waltz running for VP. I was not expecting that. And I see a lot of people are saying like Van Jones was on CNN and he was saying that he felt like Kamala picked him because 
a lot of people have wanted Josh Shapiro to be the VP because he's young, kind of fresh, but Josh Shapiro also comes with baggage. Some folks are saying the baggage is because he murdered a man and tried to cover it up as suicide. Other people are saying that the baggage is because he's Jewish. And they're saying because of all the tension with Israel and Palestine, that the reason why Kamala made this choice, because people are very, very, you know, that's a very sensitive topic. And so people may be less likely to vote for a Jewish VP. That's just what the, you know, Twitter streets are saying. And Van Jones kind of low-key feels the same way. So y'all go ahead and listen to what Van Jones had to say on CNN. He's going Do you think it was a little uh, risky, though, Van, yeah. that, that, that she didn't go with Shapiro to kind of lock down Pennsylvania? I mean, yes, yeah. David Challing was saying earlier, just because you pick him as your running mate doesn't mean you automatically win Pennsylvania. But I got to think it would have helped just a little bit. Hey, listen, that, that, the, the conservatives, the right wing, the Republicans, they were chewing their fingernails down to the knuckle because they were afraid of a Josh Shapiro. They were afraid of a Mark Kelly. They're not as afraid of this uh, new governor because they think they can define him. Uh, and I, but, so he, here's the challenge you've got in this party. Uh, and you know, people don't want to talk about it, we've got to talk about it. On the one hand, you have a, a lot of young people who are concerned about Gaza. You have a lot of Muslims and Arabs and others. They have not felt seen by the Biden administration. Uh, you start, start hearing that genocide joke, that was building, that was building. And so those folks needed to have a, a candidate that they could feel comfortable with. This helps them in that regard. But you also have anti-Semitism that has gotten marbled into this party. You can be you know, for uh, the Palestinians without being an anti-Jewish bigot, but there are some anti-Jewish bigots out there. And there's some disquiet now, and there has to be, how much of what just happened is caving into some of these darker parts in the party. So that's going to have to get worked out. It's going to have to be, yeah. get talked through. All right, so you guys just saw that clip. And then let's not forget Shapiro also, you know, compared a lot of those campus protesters when they were protesting about Israel and what they were doing to the Palestinians. Um, he was comparing those campus protesters to the KKK. So a lot of people feel like he just has a lot of baggage outside of him being Jewish, that he's definitely is going to side with Israel on everything. And people are not really in the mood for that. OK, about a disagreement on policy happening in the Middle East to be an excuse for anti-Semitism or Islamophobia on these campuses. We can't allow it to be an excuse that puts certain students at risk to be able to go to classes safely or to be able to worship safely. And universities have a responsibility to ensure the safety and well-being of their students and to make sure that the rules of the university are being followed. What I see from afar at some universities, including Columbia, is a situation that is completely out of control. And it's incumbent upon the university leadership to get it under control quickly for the benefit of the students and the people in the region. How is it out of control? I mean, there are lines, everybody, it's a so subjective. Everybody has their own view. Somebody holds up a sign. I saw one at University of Texas earlier today that uh, said something about uh, Palestine, and it's a map of all of Israel, including the West Bank and Gaza, as if that is all Palestine. Does that cross a line? Some Israeli might say, you're saying that Israel shouldn't exist anymore. Um, there are chants from the river to the sea that some people say are just uh, an expression about freedom. And some people say, no, that's calling out, that's calling for the, the elimination of the Jewish people and the Jewish state. Where do you draw the line when it comes to what you consider to be out of control? You know, Jake, there may be some subjectivity to the speech. I, I think it's clear when you're engaging in anti-Semitic rhetoric, Islamophobic rhetoric, there should be no place for that. But even before you get to what's on this sign or what is coming out in the speech, the act of gathering in the way that some of these students have at some of these universities violates university policy and may violate the rules of that particular city or that particular state. That can't be allowed in the name of free speech. And I think several of these university leaders across the country are just simply losing control of the situation. They have a responsibility to keep students safe. Students shouldn't be blocked from going to campus just because they're Jewish or learning in a classroom as opposed to being forced online because they're Jewish. It is simply unacceptable. 
And you know what? We have to query whether or not we would tolerate this if this were people dressed up in KKK outfits or KKK regalia making comments about people who are African-American in our communities. I'm certainly not condoning that, Jake, by any stretch, but I think we have to be careful about setting any kind of double standard here on our campuses. We've got to call it out for what it is, and these university leaders have to make sure there is order on their campuses. So, so I think this was a good choice in my personal opinion. I'm not mad at it. I'm just not. And I feel like Walt, you know what I'm saying? He was a former teacher. He was a National Guardsman. And like I said, he's been elected twice. He's been elected twice. And then he just comes off like an everyday person. Like when you see him at the state fair, he's with his family. He's with his kids and his wife and stuff like that. Now, I get people being upset about the whole tampon thing. But again, that's kind of, you know, it's a small thing. I mean, I, I see how that bothers people. You know, the tampon Tim meme is funny. But at the end of the day, I think his policies are not that bad. And yes, Minnesota has had their issues, but Minnesota is bouncing back. You know, we're bouncing back. Um, it's a liberal city, right? But in certain aspects, they are tough on crime. You know, they're they're cracking down on a lot of stuff. But, you know, this is home and I like Minnesota and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of low-key happy. You know what I'm saying? I'm kind of low-key happy she picked this choice. Now I'm even more interested. At first I was like, child, whatever. But now I'm kind of, you know what I'm saying? Minnesota's on the map. So now it kind of piqued my interest. Okay, Kamala, I see you. Okay. So it's going to be interesting again, you know, um... I'm excited to see this. This is going to be a very interesting battle. It's going to be interesting to see Donald Trump with, you know, J.D. Vance and now Kamala with Tim Waltz. I think this was a good choice for Kamala, in my personal opinion. I think Shapiro just comes with too much baggage. And because of the tension that's going on in this country, you know, um, with how people are upset about money being sent to Israel, bomb children in the Gaza Strip and all this stuff that's been going on for almost a year now. Um, I can see why the Democrats are kind of walking a fine line. You know, they don't want people to like really look at that or focus on that. So I think for this situation, Tim Waltz, to me, in my personal opinion, is a better choice than Josh Shapiro. But again, that's just my opinion. Y'all can have y'all's own opinion on this. You know what I'm saying? At the end of the day, do what feels right to you. Vote for who you feel the need to vote for. It doesn't matter what I say, what any other commenter says. When you're in that booth, you're in that booth by yourself. And I will always stand by I will always stand by that. So, you know, research everybody's policies, procedures, what they're about. At the end of the day, then you go with who you feel the need to go with. So that is my opinion for everybody asking about this Tim Waltz, Kamala Harris situation. So now, in other news, I want to go ahead and also talk about the Nicki Minaj, Ming Lee situation. So if you guys do not know, um, Nicki Minaj has a little sister. She's been around for years now on social media. And recently, she did an interview with We in Miami podcast. And so on that interview, she was talking about Nicki Minaj and their relationship. And um, it looks like Nicki Minaj is now low-key responding back to her. She is not happy that um, Ming Lee basically mention her in this interview. But what was life like for me growing up? It was kind of hard. And I used to be bullied a lot for it because people used to say like, oh, if this person was your sister, why did she do this for you? Why did she do that for you? And it's like, yeah. at a young age, it's like, you don't know how to answer questions like those. I never needed her to help me get to my mm -hmm. goal. I just needed her to see that I can do it and she can be proud of me without mm -hmm. having to think that I needed to have an easy way to get to the top. Is that important to you to feel that sense of independence to do it yourself? It really is important to me. I used to have this urge of just trying to like impress my sister. I'm not gonna lie, I always had this urge to impress her because anybody else, I wouldn't give a f about. So what's your current relationship with Nikki? We was never close. She was like always like busy. She be busy and stuff like that. I be doing my sh too. Like even though people do think that like we are not cool, we're going to argue. I'm not going to lie. Me, like, my dude be getting mad at me. But this is nothing new. Like, siblings going to fight. What you be doing, man? I was going to say, why? Listen, bro. <laughs> why do you think Listen, she gets bro. Why do you think she just mean, bro. Respectfully. <laughs> I'm not even going to lie. I be getting everyone tight, bro. <laughs> People were saying that y'all look just alike. Do you think you guys look like twins? I'm not going to lie. Okay. Wait. <laughs> do the face. Oh, let, me see you. So. let me see you do a face. Let me see you do the face. 
And so for the people that don't know, you and Nicki Minaj are half-sisters through your father, correct? Yeah, through my father, exactly. We have the same dad. She was a good sister. Like, she did check up on me and my dad from time to time. Like, she always made sure that we was, like, you know, at least good situated in a way. Like, it doesn't matter if she was distant or not. She was still, like, you know, being there. She was still making sure that we was all good. Like, I don't have no hate towards her. And if people think that I do, that's... That's y'all problem, not mine. <laughs> Do you think that like Nikki may be trying to protect you from like I the bad so. side? Why would a person speak on a person they love? Why would a person speak openly about a private person? Why would a person do that? Who would you say? Who would you speak about in your interviews if you if someone wanted to interview you? Yourself, right? It's always a bad sign if if um a person who doesn't who's not even in your line of work is doing interviews with people in your line of work. Like, hmm. I think y'all think talent, like you could catch it like a cold or, or maybe people could pass it through the genes. Even with blood relation, what God has given to me is mine. You have to go and get your own. You have to discover whatever it is that you're great at. Being a mooch and a clown. Don't run in my... All right, so you guys just heard that interview. And shout out to my boys who are in Miami podcast. They're doing their thing down there in Miami. I thought this interview was sweet. I th I don't think she shaded Nikki. I don't think she was disrespectful. They asked her a question, you know what I'm saying? And she answered it. And she even admitted her faults. Like, you know, like sometimes she can be argumentative and not want to listen. And sometimes she be on one. So she even took responsibility as a young woman for things that she might have done wrong. I don't see what is going on here. Like why Nikki is so upset. This does not help. When people say things like, you don't want to see other women win, you don't like to work with other women, it's just kind of sad. And at the end of the day, this is your sister. Now, granted, they didn't grow up together. This is her dad's daughter, right? It's not Carol's daughter. So they have different moms and, you know, they're over 20 years apart. And I'm not saying that Nicki Minaj has to help her out and put her on the track. I'm not saying that. But, you know, sometimes to not say anything is okay as well. You know, I don't think Ming said anything bad in that interview. I just feel like it just makes it look like you're a mean girl. Like, you don't like the girls in the industry. There's, you know, issue now with you and Ice Spice, you and Lotto, you and this person, you and that person, and now even the little sister. I just kind of thought that was sad. So Ming ended up, once this went viral of what Nikki was saying about her, she went and she wrote this. She says, I still love her. I tried as a sister to please her, but I realized I got to please God first because only he can judge the gift that he gave me. And I thought even in that response, that was very, very mature of her. You know, she still didn't come back and clap at her big sister. You know, she left a sweet response and, and kept it moving. I don't recall Ming ever acting entitled or saying that Nikki didn't help me or she didn't jump on the track. She didn't retreat my latest song. Ming been out here for years looking like who shot John. You know what I'm saying? And she's talked about it. Well, people were clowning her, saying that she looks dusty. She's wearing old Jordans. Why does she look like that? Is she's Nicki Minaj's little sister? What's fucking nigga? With whipped cream, cherry, honey, chocolate drizzle, a little vanilla on the top, a little swirl on the top, a little filmy, a little one, two, three, and then we went bop, and then then bop, and then then bop, 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 and then after that, feel me? After that shit, a shorty came to the crib. Shorty came to the crib. We had a threesome. After that shit, that shit went crazy as fuck. But the only, the only thing is that her pussy it smelled like fish. But at the same time, it's more like deodorant. So obviously, Ming ain't asking for handouts because she's not out here dripped down in Fendi. 
you know, she's living her life. She didn't ask to be Nicki Minaj's little sister, you know what I'm saying? That's just the position she was placed in. And so she has to take it with the good and the bad. But I just think it was really kind of sad because it's like, you know, that's your little sister. She has enough people attacking her. Don't go throwing, you know, low-key shots at her and then having your fans go and attack her when she's already being attacked enough. So I just think Nicki needs to chill a bit and just, you know what I'm saying, you don't have to give her anything. You don't have to put her on a track, but why sub her? It's a bit much, Nikki. It's giving mean girl vibes. So I don't know, just my thoughts. I just thought that was kind of sad. I don't think she said anything wrong in that interview because I watched the whole interview when it first came out. And I thought it was a cute interview and I thought it was nice getting to know more about her little sister because you don't really hear too much about Ming. I know she has music. So I didn't understand her response, calling her a mooch and a clown. And, you know, I thought that was a bit harsh, but that's just my opinion. So now in other news, before I go, we have to talk about this deputy, the one that killed Sonia Massey. So now he's out and he's speaking out with his skull tattoos on his forearm. People are saying that those are white supremacist tattoos. I got to do my research, but anyhow. So now he's coming out and he's saying that he feared for his life. So we're going to go ahead and watch this clip really quick. Field reports just released by the county sheriff's office reveal former deputy Sean Grayson says he feared for his life in the moments before he shot and killed Sonia Massey. Oh, it hurts you. You called us. In the new report written three days after the incident, Grayson claims it was this remark that frightened him. Oh, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. You better f not. I swear to God, I'll f shoot your face. Right. He says he interpreted this to mean she was going to kill me. I drew my weapon out and pointed it at Sonia. I gave her loud, clear verbal commands to drop the pot of boiling liquid. Drop the, pot, the drop the pot. He says as he approached, Sonia stood up from a crouched position, grabbing the pot, raising it above her head, and throwing the boiling substance at me. I was in imminent fear. Soon after, Grayson shot Massey in the face, killing the 36-year-old. I'm not taking hot boiling water in the face. According to the department, he did not activate his body camera until after shooting her, making it more challenging to verify what happened. Grayson, who has been fired, has pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder and misconduct charges. Less All right, so you guys just saw that clip, and to me, Sean Grayson is full of shit. First of all, let's start here. He claims that he feared for his life. No, what it is when she said, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, those damn demons that were inside of you feared for their life because that's almost like, you know, Jesus calling them out of you. That's what was in fear, them damn demons inside of you. Second of all, remember, he's the one who told her to go into the kitchen and get whatever was on the stove off be before it started a fire. How is she going to kill you from 10 to 15 feet away by throwing some hot boiling water? Even if she threw it, and I'm not saying that that would have been right, that wouldn't have killed him. It may have burned him, it may have scarred him, but it wouldn't have killed him. If you're that scared, you know what I'm saying, of somebody who's half your size, who's simply saying words that bother your spirit, then you shouldn't be a cop. Another thing, to me he's full of shit because his actions afterwards said a lot. Afterwards, him and the police department were still trying to hide things. They were lying to the family about what really caused her death. So if this was innocent and you really feared for your life, what was up with all the extra sauce and the made up stories and the false information being given to the family? So he's, he's full of shit. He's just trying to find a way to not, you know, end up doing time in prison. And I just think it's just really, really... Now, what's even more disturbing is a few days ago, a 911 call came out where you could hear Sonia Massey's mother basically begging the dispatcher, please do not send combative policemen that are prejudiced. Because Sonia Massey obviously had some type of mental health issues, right? And so... They were scared that, you know, something could happen where they send the wrong officer to the home and Sonia could end up dead. And so then for this to come to fruition is just insanely just disturbing. I want you guys to go ahead and listen to the audio. Now to the tragedy of Sonia Massey. In early July, the 36-year-old called 911 re reporting a possible prowler. A sheriff's deputy sent to protect her instead shot her. The Sangamon County Sheriff's Department has now released several 911 calls related to the case, and here is some of the audio from those calls. 
the mental people told me to call 911 because I don't want you guys to hurt her, please. Please don't send no combative policemen that are prejudiced, please. They're scary. I'm scared of the police. I keep hearing stuff on the outside of my house, and um, it sounds like somebody was banging on the side of my house. I don't know. I'll catch y'all come and see. So, and then late that night around 1 a.m., that's when we just heard that call. She believed she heard a prowler at her house and she called. And then we have Sean Grayson and his partner arrive at her home. We've seen that video where they enter her home. In fact, it's interesting, one of the calls released, we heard 911 call her back and check on her. And she says, the sheriff's department is here. And the dispatcher says, okay, I'm gonna let you go. And she says, no, 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 please. I thought you were going to come. The sheriff's department's going to come. Like, hold on with me. Yeah. And that call then drops. And that's chilling. And we know that that's just minutes before she's shot. All right. So you guys just heard that clip. So like I said, this entire thing was a mess from the jump. From them calling 911 to try and get help to the officers that came out. And so... For him to not be aware of the situation that he was going into and to automatically have his mind on, you know, shooting to kill is insane to me. So I'm not buying that he was fearing for his life. Um, He didn't sound like he was in fear for his life when he was calling her a crazy bitch outside when he was caught on audio, you know, talking mess about her. Yeah, I'm good. This fucking bitch is crazy. So I don't feel bad for Sean at all. Send his ass to prison. Good riddance. So with that being said, y'all, let's go ahead and get the discussion popping. So let me know your thoughts on all these stories here concerning Kamala Harris choosing Tim Waltz as her VP running mate. How do y'all feel about that? And then how do y'all feel about Nicki Minaj blasting her little sister? And, and then last but not least, how do y'all feel about Sean Grayson claiming that he feared for his life and he thought that Sonia Massey intended to kill him? So I look forward to reading y'all's comments. Thank you guys once again for tuning in. And I should have the rest of the Puerto Rico videos done. Give me like a day or two because I'm still going through the clips and stuff like that. So thank y'all once again. I'll talk to y'all later. Have a good day. Bye. If you want the latest news in the streets, join us sentiment in for the tea. Breaking news with integrity, so sell your friends and your family.